so everything you ever wanted to know about visual fields. So first of all, we'll start with kind of the basics of what is a visual field test, why do we do it, how do we pick which test we're going to use, all that stuff. Um, so normal visual field is, you know, basically just limited by your anatomy. So widest temporally and then narrowest because of your nose and your, your eyebrows are limiting there. Um, but that's what a normal visual field is. The vast majority of this um, is just very unsensitive areas of the retina. So that's why we only test within the central 30 degrees because that's where most of the retinal ganglion cells are located. And even within that 30 degrees, that peripheral edge of your 30 degree visual field isn't very sensitive. So what is a perimetry test? It's basically giving you a map of the visual field. There's two different kinds. There's the kinetic, which gives you a topographic map, and then there's the static, which gives you a vertical map. And um, what is an abnormal visual field? It's any defect or depression in sensitivity compared to the normal hill of vision. So your sensitivity is basically your ability to detect light. You can have a focal scotoma or diffuse relative or absolute scotoma. And then this is the one the patients always want to know about. Well, how come I don't notice that I'm losing my vision? It's because of the filling in effect, which is the same reason why you don't notice your own blind spot. Your brain is taking your con context clues from everything else that's around and filling in that gap. It does the same thing with glaucoma. I, tell, I describe it to patients as like the Photoshop effect. So it basically your brain is taking what it thinks should be there and filling it in. That's why patients will sometimes, when they are first noticing their glaucoma, They'll say, hey, like when I play tennis, all of a sudden I feel like the ball is all of a sudden in my face. And that's because they're not able to compensate anymore. The movement of the ball is revealing all of their new visual field defects. Or why cars are like all of a sudden sneaking up on them. Their brain can't compensate for moving objects. And so that unmasks their visual field defects. So this is the diagram that you see in your books. And I never really understood what this was the whole time I was a resident. It made zero sense to me. I was like, I don't understand what this is trying to show me. Um, basically, if you think of your visual field as an island of vision in a sea of darkness, it's this kind of thing coming out of the water, and there's different levels of the ability of your visual field to detect light. So it can be measured in two different ways like an airplane looking down, doing an actual topographical map, and that's your gold man field, where the highest point in your visual field is your most sensitive. That's the area that can detect light the best. And then the lowest point is the peripheral field that has the lowest sensitivity, or like a ship at sea that's actually seeing an island come out of the water. And that is a Humphrey visual field, if that makes sense. So there's your, there's your island. You're looking down on it from above. You're slicing those layers into layers of the cake, and then you get your topographical map. And each one of those lines is an isopter or a level of brightness. So this works, right? Does the mouse work? Does anything work? Whatever. You guys know. So the, the far peripheral one is the brightest light, and then moving in and in and in is increasing, decreasing levels of brightness. Um, and then here is the vertical map. So in the middle, so the, the island of vision is measured by depth of sensitivity. So the highest, most sensitive point is the apex of the hill, which is your macula. And that's why the numbers in the middle of your visual field printout in the raw data are the biggest numbers, because it's the most sensitive part. So you'll see there's naturally a drop off if you look at the raw data in your visual field as you move from central to peripheral. And that's not because there's any visual field defect there. That's just because naturally that part of the eye is less sensitive, if that makes sense. OK, so what are we measuring and how are we measuring it? The basic unit is the decibel and the apostilb. Um, the apostilb is a measure of the luminance of light, which is basically light intensity. For Humphrey, the maximum brightness is 10,000 apostilbs. And then the decibel is a measure of attenuation of that light. So light is attenuated within the visual field by using uh, neutral density filters. The higher the decibel means the more attenuation, so the dimmer the stimuli. So a decibel of like 32 is a much dimmer stimuli than a decibel of 10, 
if that makes sense. And it's a logarithmic scale, which we'll get into in just a second. So when you see on your raw data printout a decibel of zero, it does not mean that the patient couldn't see that light. It means the patient could see that light that had zero attenuation. So the patient was able to see light without any attenuation at all, the brightest stimulus the machine can provide. When the machine gives you a value of less than zero, again, it doesn't mean that the patient is absolutely blind in that area, it just means that the patient's not capable of seeing the brightest light that the machine can produce. But if you take a Fenhoff and shine it in their eye, you know, they can see something. And then we're measuring to find threshold, which is the dimmest stimuli or the most attenuated amount of light that is seen by the patient 50% of the time. And that's why patients hate this test is because they feel like they're constantly like second guessing themselves. Did I miss something? Like, I feel like I should be seeing more. I felt like maybe I saw that light, but I'm not sure. That's what the machine is trying to do is find that level where they can just barely see it. Once I tell them that, Oftentimes they feel a lot better about taking the test. So, sorry, this makes me laugh. You should read it. <laughs> um, so, now we know what we're measuring. Now, how do we choose the right test for the right patient? We talked about kinetic versus static. There are some, <coughs> sometimes when a kinetic is the better choice for the patient. Um, or, you know, one, if you think they're, they're faking, it's a lot harder to fake a Kinetta Goldman than it is to fake a Humphrey. Uh, so for non-organic vision loss, really, really severe vision loss where you feel like your, your fields are just blacked out on a Humphrey, also oftentimes you'll be able to, with that brightest stimulus in a Goldman, still be able to find something that you can follow. Um, or like disability certification, things like that is better with Kinetic. Static is pretty much used for everything else. This is an example of a patient that I have in my clinic um, who has blackout fields, both 24-2 and 10-2. He's also a really terrible test taker, as you can see, and that's not unsurprising in really severe glaucoma. They're bad test takers, not because they're not paying attention, but just because the nature of glaucoma makes it difficult. And so he's got 62% false negative rate and really high fixation losses. Is basically no visual field left. But we get a gold mount on him, and you can see right eye compared to left eye. Left eye, he still has some reasonable feel that we can follow using this test, and right eye is in a pretty bad state. But I can follow him now with a gold mount once a year and still get some sense of if he's getting worse or not. So choosing the right test, you can choose a pattern, dash one or dash two. Does anybody know what dash one and dash two means? For the longest time, I thought it meant one eye or two, like dash one, dash two, like um, both eyes. Yeah, no, not, not what it means. Um, it's referring to the layout of where the dots are with respect to the horizontal and vertical meridians. And so it used to be when you did a visual field test, there was a dot right on the meridians. But you can imagine if you have like a neurological defect that's, that's respecting anatomical pathways, it's going to be really difficult to assess defects right along that line, right? So now you, if you straddle the line, then you get a sense of whether or not they truly are respecting the horizontal or vertical meridian. Does that make sense? So that's why everything that you order is a dash two, because you get better information. For that reason, dash one isn't an option anymore. They've just taken it out. And then you can vary the degrees of field tested. You can do 30, 24, 10. You can even do a central five if you wanted. And this shows you what data you get with each test. So this big one here is the 30. And then I drew in the line to show you what data you're getting with the 24. So the difference in information that's gathered between a 24-2 and a 30-2 really isn't that much. It's just that very far peripheral rim of testing. And you can see nasally, you often, you will always get the, the nasal 30 degrees even in a 24-2 so that you're not missing a nasal step. The reason why 24 is now done instead of 30 is the vast majority of times you're getting defects in that very far periphery. It's not real, it's artifactual due to decreased sensitivity of that part of the retina. So they just figured, you're getting a lot more false positives that way, let's just narrow the field 
bring it in by one, and you get a 24-2, which is more reliable. And then the reason why we do a 10-2, you can see the 10-2 is, is that area of a lot more dots in the next picture. It gives you a lot more information in the central, so you can see theoretically how you might miss small defects in the central vision if you're doing a 24-2 compared to a 10. 10, you're getting a lot more pieces of data. Does the 10 still go out to 24? Is that what that's showing? No, it's okay. showing it's showing what what like how how no spaced out these data okay. points are. So if you're just getting 24-2, then you're only getting within the central 10 degrees, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, you know, these spots uh, instead of uh, all of these spots. Does that make sense? So in a patient where like if you had like a, a central defect right here. It would be hard to know if it's getting worse just doing a 24-2 with these points. So you could do a 10-2, and that would zoom in on that area and give you a lot more data points, and you'd be able to better assess for progression. Does that make sense? Can you just do a combined one? You can. You can. The problem you run into is so long. length. Yeah. And so there are some people who say, you know, if you have patients with any type of central or paracentral defects, they should be getting 10-2s and 24-2s every time you do a visual field test. It ends up being, most patients don't tolerate that. I try and all, like do like, try and do like a 10-2 on a central defect patient like once every 18 months while I'm also doing 24-2s. So it ends up, you know, I think you get really valuable data from it. Certainly if the only defect that they had was a 10 2 or was a central, you could do 10 2s and then maybe once in a while do a 24 2 to make sure you're not, you know, missing new nasal steps. Um, the very newest Humphrey is coming up with some kind of modified hybrid between a 24 and a 10 where the central testing has more data points in between. But we don't have that capacity yet. And so then you can also vary the size. Standard size is a size three, um, but you can increase it. Oftentimes we'll bump it up to a size five in patients with really poor vision. You can also do one, two, and four, but we just don't for some reason. Those aren't used. You can see relative to the blind spot, they're all much smaller than the relative blind spot, and they all increase by a factor of four. That's, I think, an OCAPS question. So again, choosing the right test, you can see oftentimes when do we do it a 10-2 compared to a 24? Well, we'll usually do it on these central island patients because the 24-2 is not going to give you enough pieces of information to assess whether or not that central defect is getting worse. So you zoom in and you can see how much of a better picture it gives you and it's much easier to assess for progression in a 10-2. And then when do we do a size five compared to a size three? I think of that more as my I'll do like a 10-2, say this patient's 20-20 with a central island, which is not uncommon. Then I would do a 10-2 with a size 3. Say this patient's like 20-100 because they also have macular degeneration or some other thing going on they can't see very well. Usually for the patients with the poor vision is when you bump it up to the size 5 compared to a size 3. You can of course also do a size 5 10-2 if you wanted. But again, you can see by using a size 5, I've given myself better tool to assess this visual field and follow them in the future. So you could do threshold versus super threshold. Super threshold is six decibels more intense than the light that age match controls are guaranteed to see. So it's pretty much a guarantee that you will see it. The best way, this is usually used, um, it's like a bluff assessment, where can you see it? Is it absolutely distinguished? not, you can see it okay, then your eyelid isn't in the way, but it's really not useful for following glaucoma patients, so they get threshold testing. And then strategy, it used to be everyone got a full threshold test, but that was absolutely miserable into forever. So everything's been replaced by the Swedish interactive testing algorithm, which uses best guess data to present initial stimuli, and it says, well, you're a you know, 72 year old Gentlemen, age match controls say this is where we should start you and you should be able to see this and then it varies what is presented next based on your initial responses. So that's, you can see how that would 
naturally cut down on testing quite a bit on testing time. And so is that like, so it'll like shine a light of a certain intensity in one spot, and if they don't see it, it'll increase the intensity. Increase it. Okay. What did the other ones do? They then? just they did all light intensities. Oh really? Mm -hmm. Even but it was not adaptive. It wouldn't. It would just be like start. It would just be the same for everybody. Yeah. That's terrible. Man. Yeah. So you can see why it used to take forever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the CETA makes certain assumptions about spots in between your responses in other spots. Yeah. And yeah. so it it basically makes pre assumptions, and so it can miss smaller defects in between. Okay. Um. So the standard test. Three to seven minutes with a CETA standard, because you'll you know what's the difference between CETA standard and CETA fast. Uh, so that cuts that's pretty much cuts in half a full threshold test, which is nice. You can make it even faster by using the CETA fast. People will often think, oh well, my patients can't sit through; they get distracted if they're doing a CETA standard. So we should do a CETA fast. True in some respects, not true in others. What a fast does is kind of cuts through and says. Instead of starting at a light that I, that age match data says you are guaranteed to see, I'm going to start at a light that age match data says will be your threshold. So it's skipping right to the really tough part of the test, essentially. And for that reason, it's a little bit faster, but also for that reason, it's a little bit more frustrating for patients. It's also less tolerant of mistakes. So if you have a patient who is not doing well on a CETA standard and you think the answer is a CETA fast, you might find that you do even worse on it because it's just more frustrating to them. So in part of the deciding whether or not to do a standard or a fast, ask them, you know, is it a matter of you just having not having enough attention span or are you getting frustrated with the test? And then these are ones that are talked about a lot in like BCSE and tested on um, that you don't really see all that much. There was some thinking, SWAP, shortwave automated perimetry, there was thinking that, um, the, that testing for the blue visual field defects on a yellow background might help unmask earlier glaucoma changes. Um, the more recent data doesn't really support this. I, I, don't ever do it. I don't think I've ever seen any of my mentors do it. It's not really used that much anymore. Um, you'll probably get, you might get asked about it on the OCAPs. Uh, and then frequency doubling is kind of what you'll see when you get the referrals from optometrists, the ones that look like this, where you're like, what kind of visual field test is this? Um, and it's a really good screening test, but it obviously doesn't give you enough data to follow patients. So it'll say, hey, there's something wrong with your visual field, go see an ophthalmologist. Uh, but beyond that, it's not really useful. Okay, so giving the test. Basically, this is just a short slide to know that having good staff give the test gets you better results. And this has been validated in studies. When the staff is well trained and invested in getting good data, data quality improves. If you have a staff that isn't paying attention at all as the patient's taking the test, then reliability decreases. It also helps, um, data has shown that when patients fully understand the value of the test, they get better results. <laughs> I feel like this is especially appropriate for Utah because everyone loves essential oils here. I don't understand this. <laughs> Okay, so what are we looking at? Now we're, now we're on to figuring out what this test is trying to show us. This thing is called the SFA, Single Field Analysis Report. So you guys know where everything is, patient and test data, the reliability indices, the raw data that shows you threshold sensitivities, and then the grayscale map, which is a picture representation of the raw data, and then your pattern maps, and then your field indices, and your gaze tracker. So a lot of data sitting here on this one chart. Obviously, the first thing to do when you're going through this is just to make sure that the patient and test data is accurate. I've had several um, left eyes be tested as right eyes. Go back. Uh, you want to make sure that the patient's age is in there correctly because this is all age match data, right? So if 
the ages entered incorrectly that will give you false information. Uh, you know, in the book you'll read about pupil size and how that can give you like a ring artifact if it's too small. I don't know if that I've ever seen that. And then it'll obviously tell you what test you're getting. Um, and then your reliability indices. So it starts with fixation losses. They estimate fixation losses by projecting a light where they've previously identified your blind spot to be. And if you click, then it says, well, you obviously are not fixated where you used to be because now you're seeing a light that is supposed to be in your blind spot. Um, it can be elevated in a lot of cases where it's not actually impacting the reliability of the field. So of all the reliability indices, it's probably the least important. Um, and it can be artifactually elevated because one, maybe your blind spot wasn't identified correctly. So maybe you're staring straight off and haven't moved your eyes at all during the entire test, but your blind spot was just identified incorrectly. And so it's reading your response as, as a fixation loss and really you're just still looking straight ahead. Uh, trigger happy patients are gonna click even if they didn't see a light, so that's gonna be identified uh, as a fixation loss. And oftentimes, especially our older patients who have trouble um, half the VA who can't you know, get into the machine comfortably or in a wheelchair, they end up just kind of melting over time. And even though their gaze isn't moving, their head is, and so they're getting a lot of fixation losses from that. For that reason, I actually think the gaze tracker gives you a little bit better information because it shows you where they're looking um, and how often they're looking away from where they should be fixating. These are these are all our VA, lovely VA patients. When the gaze tracker, when the, when when you see something like that, the gaze tracker is given up. <laughs> it, like it basically has just said, I can't even identify where your eye is anymore because it's so far from where it should be. Uh, and every up deviation is is a look away, and the size of the up deviation is how far away you're looking. And then down deviation is eyelid closed. I had a really good one where it's just like a bar of Downward. down, and that's where the patient fell asleep, and I can't find it. <laughs> You'll see that at the VA, not infrequently. So then false positives, that's the machine trying to trick you into responding when there really isn't a stimulus. It's the most important reliability of the indices, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. Um, but anything really over 15% is essentially a garbage test and not reliable anymore. False negatives are found by presenting super threshold stimuli in a location that we've already established um, you have normal sensitivity, if that makes sense. And then um, it's frequently elevated in glaucoma patients, even highly attentive ones, just because of the nature of those defects. Oftentimes if you're shining like right on the edge of a scotoma, sometimes they can see it and sometimes they can't. It's not that they're unreliable in taking the test, it's just they're just responding to the nature of their glaucoma. Okay, so now we get to the data, the raw threshold data and grayscale. So when you get your printout and you see the numbers right next to your grayscale data, that is just pure sensitivity in decibels. So that's where you'll see the numbers are highest here in the middle, 34, 33. That's your best sensitivity in your macula, and then they fall off as you go towards the periphery. Less than zero means you didn't respond to the brightest stimuli. Zero means you responded only to the brightest stimuli. And then it's a logarithmic scale after that. So 10 decibels is a brightness, 1 tenth as bright as max. 20 decibels is 1 one hundredth as bright as max. And maximum threshold is about like 38 for young, healthy individuals like us. And then the gray scale map is a visual representation of the raw threshold data, which is why you have to be cautious when you use the grayscale only. If you're just looking at the grayscale to judge a visual field, it's gonna give you not all that reliable of data because you need that aged match. And we'll talk about that in a second. So again, just, to, just as a reminder, so what do you think this patient sees? They're less than zero everywhere. It was working just a second ago. Oh, was it? Oh, no, oh, that's not, that's my thing. So less than zero everywhere except for here, two, five, three, three. What's the good? Sorry. How, how, what, guess the cutie? 20, 20, 20. Yeah. Because their foveal threshold just 
is 28. So foveal threshold is the first part of the test where they test like your, your fovea sensitivities, and that is not captured in this test. So this patient, yeah, can still see 2020. But that's why, again, the grayscale is unreliable, because you show this to a patient, they think, oh my god, I'm blind. Which is, you know, good to scare them, but then they're like, well, why can I still see? So we get to our deviation maps. There's this, this is a total deviation map. And you have the numerical map on top and then the probability map on the bottom. And what this is, is comparing that raw data to your age match controls and saying what is the difference in sensitivity between what you responded and what someone your age should respond to. And so that's why this is almost always slightly negative. You'll see these numbers if you look at them in our in our patients, you know, it's like minus one, minus two, or minus 20, or minus 30, depending on the depth of the defect. So this, um, every once in a while, you'll see a positive, like up here. This patient, maybe they had eyelid surgery compared to all their other age match peers <laughs> who have some ptosis, and so they actually see a little bit better in this area, which is why these numbers are positive. So compared to their peers, they, see, they have higher sensitivities here and then a little bit lower sensitivities everywhere else. And then the question is, well, is this just kind of like normal amount of variation or is this pathologic? And that is what the probability map is telling you is what is the chance that this is pathologic compared to what normal is? And so it's, you know, it's graded. There's a less than 5% chance that this is normal. There's a less than 2% chance that this is normal, less than 1% chance and less than 0.5% chance that this is normal. So that is what the probability map is showing you. How and does it, how does it, uh, how does it count? Yeah. Magic? I mean, I feel like, cause like that total deviation map is like, okay, this is, that's just so great. It, I mean, they just have, must have done like huge studies. There's huge numbers. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know. It's an, it would be interesting to look into how often those numbers are updated. Like, how often do you update your age match norms? I don't know the answer to that. Not even age match norms, but the the probability of uh, yeah the of age match being, norms being, being pathological or not pathological. It's it, a lot of assumptions. It's there. a lot. Yeah. A little statistician in there. Calculating yeah. values. Yeah. Inside the machine. Yeah. Inside <laughs> <laughs> <Sound laughs> the machine. So then we go to our pattern deviation maps. And just like with your total deviation, your pattern deviation gives you your numerical map on the top and then your, um, your probability map on the bottom. And the difference between the two is the numerical map in the pattern deviation is adjusting for sensitivity, assuming an overall decline in vision. So it's saying, we know that probably at your age, Everyone's got a little bit of a cataract uh, or something. There's some kind of maybe a media opacity. And so we're gonna, we're gonna screen that out. It takes the seventh most sensitive non-edge spot and sets that as normal. Non-edge because these are often much less reliable. So it doesn't wanna use one of these. It uses these kind of more central spots and says, what is the seventh most sensitive spot in the field? We're gonna make that our new normal and set that as Zero. So you can see here in the total deviation numerical map, this is a minus two. It's been set to a zero now. So this is now the new baseline and everything else is compared to this. So it's saying we expect overall that given this patient's overall decline in their field, all these numbers can be subtracted by, by minus two, essentially. And that will screen out whatever media opacity is affecting their visual field. And that leaves you, that's why you'll see, we often will look at the pattern deviation maps first because it screens out everything else that's going on in the eye and attempts to unmask their focal defects. Well, that's why we say most clinically useful analysis negates worsening cataracts and it also de-emphasizes common artifactual patterns like eyelids or rim artifact. Does that, make, does that make sense? This also explains why high false positives are the worst kind of error that you can make on a visual field. Because if you are going along, taking your test, and you're clicking at everything, the computer is going to measure your sensitivity as being a lot higher than what it should be. 
And then it's going to take that information when it's going from your total deviation to your pattern deviation and it's going to set an artif artificially high number as the standard for your pattern deviation. And then it's going to unmask defects that really aren't there at all, if that's making sense. That's why when you see when you see these like big white spots over here, where this means super high um, false positives, or this means super high sensitivity, like there's, there's like no defects here at all. It unmasks this giant field defect here that's not even seen on your total deviation because this patient responded with like, I don't know, probably like a plus three or a plus four, plus five compared to age match controls. That makes this whole field look bad once you set a plus four as the norm. So that's why false positives make everything unreliable. Any questions about that? Are those plus ones through fives or whatever, like, are those all in decibels also, or are they some different scale? The, this is all, this is on decibels. Okay. It's like the difference in decibels. So it's like a minus, your minus one decibel from your 34 in this spot, or your 34 in that spot, is two decibels higher than the age match controls. So when you have a field that looks like that on the right, the, uh -huh. that where the pattern deviation is way just, worse. Yes, yeah, so like that's pretty unreliable. Yeah. Right? Okay. You don't know. Like maybe they do have a defect there, but you have no reliability to know what it looks like. What if the opposite is true? If the opposite is true, so if, if you have a ton of total deviation but no pattern, then that points towards cataract or dry eye. Okay. Either global media opacity, like cataract, dry eye. But they can't even like the seventh most corneal edema. Right? Okay. Usually, that's what that means. Okay. Oh. We'll talk about that right now. Um, so com when you compare total deviation to pattern deviation, if they're identical. That means there's no generalized depression present. So like this, those two maps are exactly identical. They have a small field defect, looks like a little, you know, kind of nasally step there. Um, but there's no other thing, there's no media opacity, nothing else is going on. You can have a big total deviation depression without a focal pattern, which points to media opacity. Or you can have pattern deviation a lot worse than total deviation, and that almost always points to a high false positive rate. There's one instance where it doesn't. If you know, if the patient's like crazy reliable and they have amazing vision, but they also have early glaucoma, every once in a while you'll see a pattern. You'll see pattern deviation show a defect that doesn't show up on total deviation. The way you would know the difference is because you don't have a high false positive rate. If that makes sense. And then the last of the field indices is the glaucoma hemifield test, which is basically taking, you know, it's splitting this test right down the middle and then comparing this to this, this to this, this to this, and saying, is there any focal defect here that's not seen here? And it does this little fancy calculation and qualifies the field as being outside normal limits, borderline, and then it can't qualify it when there's abnormally high sensitivity, so high false positive rates make this unreliable, or if it's like a very, very depressed field, they also can't do this test because there's just too much similarity between the two, and then it'll qualify it as normal. And it's very sensitive and specific, um, so 94% specificity with borderline treated as normal, and 84% specificity when borderline is treated as pathologic. So this is a good thing just for like your normal patients or screening patients if the glaucoma hemifield test comes up as abnormal, do a little bit more digging. Then there's the visual field index. It's the newest of the indices. It's less affected by media opacities. I kind of talk to patients as a, you know, it's a percentage of your overall vision. Um, and it's designed to reflect ganglion cell loss, which is which makes sense because you want to follow that. So it's center weighted. So a small focal defect in the center will be weighted more than maybe a larger defect up here. And then there's your mean deviation, how much on average the whole field departs from age normal. It's also center weighted and it's uh, linear. 
and it's useful in staging and tracking progression. So it goes from a normal field having a mean deviation of zero decibels, extreme field loss is minus 30 to 35 decibels. You can see here this guy has essentially nothing, you know, nothing left of his field up here. It's minus a bazillion up here. His mean deviation fits, I think it's what, minus 33 something. His pattern deviation is nothing. He has like no focal defects left. So why is that? Pattern standard deviation is a comparison of points on this relative to other points. So it's looking for a difference between point A and point B. Fields that are uniformly depressed have points that are the same. So your pattern standard deviation is not going to find a big difference between the two. So pattern deviation, while mean deviation will go like this in glaucoma patients, pattern will go like this. Because as glaucoma gets worse and worse, those focal defects become more and more global. And the difference between the points next to each other gets less and less, if that makes sense. For that reason, it's not something where you want to follow that number. Okay, so interpreting the field. <laughs> it's best to just have, kind of like reading an x-ray, it's best to have a flow of how you do it or a way of thinking about it. Look at the patient demographics, identify the field. Is the field reliable? Is the field normal or abnormal? What is the pattern of abnormality? Is the abnormality real or is it artifact? Is the field getting worse? And then is there clinical correlation? So we all know neurologic patterns, how they look. Retinol, you know, we don't do visual fields as often in retina, but oftentimes our glaucoma patients will also have retinal disease, yes? I might have missed this, but what was the whole, like, phobia on, phobia off thing? Phobia on, phobia off, it just, it tests that central spot. Um, and so it gives you valuable information even in, like, that blackout field that that patient, his phobia sensitivity was still 28. So for that reason, we like it on. Um, I don't know why it gets turned off. There should, it should never get turned off. It should always just be on. It's the very first part of the test, if you've ever taken it, where they have you look at like the little cross, and then they have you fixate up. Glaucoma patterns of field loss, they always respect the nerve fiber layer. So if you know the anatomy of the nerve fiber layer, you know, you can decide whether or not a field defect is artifactual or not. And so the biggest clue is, is it respecting this horizontal meridian? The basic patterns of glaucoma field loss, nasal step, arcuate defect, paracentral, altitudinal, and end stage. So classic nasal steps respect this midline. Again, classic nasal step respecting the midline here. Um, you can have an upper and a lower nasal step and it gets a little bit less clear, but generally speaking, Early nasal, nasal steps will always respect that horizontal meridian. The arcuate scotoma, again, respecting the horizontal meridian. Paracentral scotoma, also, again, respecting the, the, the horizontal meridian. And then end stage. This looks like the VA on Mondays. Okay, so common artifacts. Incorrect patient, we talked about wrong age wrong prescription, learning effect, our lid artifact, rim artifact, slip blind spot is probably one you haven't heard of before, inattentive patient and trigger happy patient. So this is a patient um, who had, had um, hyperopic, myopic LASIK correction, some big LASIK correction, and in between their field and didn't tell anybody. And they programmed their old or old glasses prescription, oh, minus four, or minus four myope. Programmed their old glasses prescription in and had this funky looking visual field. Once they actually said, oh, actually you don't need your glasses prescription anymore because you've had LASIK, their visual field goes to normal. So it really does make a difference making sure that the glasses prescription is Accurate. So for us, for our cataract surgery patients, if they've had cataract surgery and they don't need their glasses anymore, making sure that we're, the techs are at least updating the MRX, entering it correctly. <coughs> Learning curve is a huge thing. Never trust a first field ever, ever, ever. There are people who say you should get three fields in three months on patients where you're trying to decide if they have glaucoma just to see whether these defects are reappearing. Um, I don't do it quite that much, but I do try and get two fields in three months. Um, because of this, because 
people take crap tests when they're first starting and then they figure it out and their test gets much better. Lid artifact, this is a classic lid artifact and the biggest thing is that it's not respecting, there's no anatomical like nerve fiber layer that this defect is respecting. You can see how this is probably all eyelid and then you take their eyelid and boom they get better. Rim artifact, rim artifact is a bigger deal in a 30-2 than a 24-2 which is one of the other reasons why we switched over but the biggest way to to decide whether something is rim artifact is there's a huge drop off from normal to absolute. Like in glaucoma, you don't often have things that are that are relatively normal sensitivities and then like, you know, you might see zeros here. That will tell you, you went from a, that's, it's like an eyelid, right? You can see something's blocking you and you can't see. So it's normal, horribly abnormal, and a very small area will tell you it's probably more something is blocking the vision there. Slipped blind spot is something that happens when you're fixated in the wrong position. So the foveal sensitivity test happens first and you're looking down at a little cross. Sometimes patients will forget to refixate up on the gaze tracker part of it. So if they're spending the whole time looking down here, it's going to show their blind spot being too low and it's going to bring kind of random retina into this top part of the field that shouldn't be in there that's not as sensitive. So you'll get these weird field defects that like this you know, this doesn't fit anything, but there's something there. What do you make of it? Well, that's just because, you know, retina from here is being tested that isn't as reliable. And sometimes you can have blind spots that are too high. It's not as common because, you know, it, oftentimes if they're fixating, they're fixating on the, on the little phobia cross instead. But who knows? Sometimes they're looking up or looking wherever. If they're not fixated right on the gaze tracker, then their blind spot can appear in a random place. And then we talked about trigger happy patients and why that's bad, and it will give you these kind of weird pattern defects that don't show up on your total deviation. Is the field progressing? This is where you use your field indices and your gut, essentially. So, um, you know, obviously the mean deviation is getting worse. Pattern deviation is getting worse. So this is like a mild, moderate glaucoma patient that is progressing. And then in this patient, you can see the mean deviation starting way down here instead of starting at you know one or two we're starting at 17 and it's continuing to just go downhill this is bad news probably this patient should have gotten a trab about here and then the other thing that's bad news is that the pattern is actually going back up again so that means those focal defects are now becoming like blackout fields so you can also use mean deviation and pattern deviation to tell you you know, what's going on with this patient? Their mean deviation is getting worse, but their pattern's not changing. Well, uh, maybe they had a cataract, and then maybe we took their cataract out. So you can see all that reflected. Then there's the visual field index that you can track over time, and it will give you sometimes a nice little line here that tells you how bad they're getting worse and relative to their age. So this, if this was a 98, you might not care as much. And if this was a 58, you might care a lot more. So it's helpful to give you an idea of age and rate of progression. And then you can look at the maps. So this is from the Iowa glaucoma um, cur curriculum. The sad story is that this is a patient who got a visual field literally every year, um, but their pressures were always normal, so their doctor didn't look at their visual field. So he got it and he didn't look at it. Yeah, he's like, well, the pressures were normal, so I never looked at the field. So look at, look at your visual fields, people. And then again, another example of just progression look, using kind of grayscale <coughs> in the maps to, to identify that. All right, cases, how much time do we have? 10 minutes, we can do it. Do you have any questions about, I know that was a lot of information. Questions about the information? Okay, so. 56-year-old female presenting with two years of vision changes in the left eye. Her vision is the right eye is 20-20, left eye 20-40. Pressures are normal. She has a one plus RAPD in the left eye. So you're like, oh, I'm going to get a visual field. So, field normal or abnormal? abnormal. Yes, abnormal. What is the pattern? What would you call that? Central. 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 Yeah, paracentral, early nasal step. Do you think this is real or artifactual? Numbers up there. She has zero fixation losses, 1% false positive, 3% false negative. It's real. real. Yeah. yeah. So does she have glaucoma? No. No. She does. 
<laughs> this is a patient, this is, it's actually sad, this patient has been coming to us for two years complaining of visual field. Her visual field looks worse than this actually, but the story is, is accurate. The patient has been coming to us for two years complaining of vision changes in her left eye. And we, got, we finally got a field on her and she has normal pressure glaucoma um, and has lost quite a bit of vision in her left eye. Um, but she has really tilted nerves, so it's hard to see, you know it's hard to see cupping. And for a long time, her vision was still 20/20 in this eye. It wasn't until she had an RAPD that you started. And actually, it's probably a little bit bigger RAPD um, that we got a field. So, moral of the story: If a patient complains of like funny vision problems in an eye, just get a visual field on them. And make sure there's nothing funny going on. Okay. So yeah, paracentral. Scotoma is most common in normal tension glaucoma, and they can be really small, but since they're central, they can really mess up a patient's vision. Okay, case number two. 51-year-old male post-motor vehicle accident with persistent headaches and vision problems. He says he can't see anything. He's 2100 in both eyes. Pressures are normal, no RAPD, and you get a field on him. So is the field normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Okay, what is this pattern? Arcuate. It looks, yeah, maybe a little nasal something. It's kind of a weird. Uh, do you think this is real or artifactual? A lot of false negatives, but not false positives. False negatives are okay. Yeah. Right. Hello, so. thirty-three. Is that what false negatives are okay? Better than false positives. That's true. Yes. It's kind of cloverly. <laughs> yeah. How soon post that MVA? Uh, like six Still months. Still swollen. We're all second guessing ourselves. Yeah. It's not easy. Yeah. It's, I mean, field, some, it's fields aren't, aren't always easy to interpret. So do you think he has glaucoma? What does his nerve look like? <laughs> <laughs> nerve looks normal. Okay. Totally healthy. Totally healthy. Totally healthy nerve. Probably not real. Or yeah. not glaucoma. Oh, nice job. job. What is it? Is it clover leaves? Uh, yeah. So clover leaves can be subtle. This is actually me trying to do a clover leaf. <laughs> um, but they can be subtle. The, the biggest keys, he, it, it, it's not, there's kind of, this is kind of like garbagey, like she doesn't really respect this line here. I mean, a little bit it does, but false negatives are fine, but also a sign of, you know, in someone where everything else looks normal. Like you would get an OCT on this patient and it would show totally healthy nerve and you'd be like, what this? And then you, you would see the clover leaf. So that's where your clinical context will come in as well. And then the gauge tracker, you can see I was really trying not to pay attention. Uh, I tried to, yeah. <laughs> I felt like I was closing it forever, but the gauge tracker was unimpressed. <laughs> so oftentimes the ones that you will see are these clover leaves. And that's the, the reason why they look like this often is because the first four stimuli are here, 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 and here, and they're really bright. So if you have a patient who just stops paying attention after those four, that's why you'll get things that look like this, because it's, it's responding to like the first few stimuli that they're getting. Okay. Reliable or unreliable? Hard to assess from this. Normal or abnormal? It's abnormal. Okay. What is the pattern? Yeah, rim artifact, good job. So it's a steep drop off from normal to abnormal. You get these like block, really dark defects and then everything else is normal. This was a patient, so then again, you correlate it. Like you ask the text, hey, were they sitting back from the lens, that can give you rim artifact, or were they wearing their plus 10 aphic expects, giving them this huge rim defect. Okay, case four, 61 year old referred for glaucoma suspect with positive family history and borderline IOP. She's 20 20 in both eyes. Pressures are 23 and 21. She has no RAPD. Her RNFL um, OCT looks normal. Is this field normal or abnormal? It looks, looks mostly normal. What do you make of these right here? <laughs> she has high false positives, 19%. So do you think she has glaucoma? Maybe, but not right now. Yeah. 
Good job. There's a disconnect there. So again, this is a, a patient who is a little bit trigger happy. She was maybe a little bit nervous. She doesn't have glaucoma yet. You'd still want to follow her. <laughs> okay. She doesn't do her fields correctly. She's going to get it. Is the field reliable? Yes, it was. Is the field normal or abnormal? Abnormal. Obviously, it's abnormal. What pattern is there? Right, so what do you think this patient has? Wrong age, but it's Yeah, cataract. <laughs> okay. So this one, apparently I didn't animate this one. <laughs> this one is, you know, what, what do you notice here? There's all this generalized depression, right? But when you screen that generalized depression out, there's still this superior arcuate defect here. So what do you think this is? Glaucoma. And a cataract. Take Glaucoma a and a cataract. So that's what these look like. A lot of total deviation. <laughs> when that's screened out, you still have this nasal defect, this partial arcuate. Same thing here. A lot of deviation, but still have this defect here. <coughs> okay. This one's tricky. What is that? Is that? It's this field is reliable. Is this normal or abnormal? Um, what is the pattern? Nasal step. Is this glaucoma? Yes. No. This is, I'll tell you why in just a second. Compared to this one, reliable, abnormal, nasal step, is this glaucoma? Yes. This just is not respecting this midline. This nasal part here, it's, remember that's, that's the only part of a 24-2 that's testing your 30 degrees. You're a lot more likely to just get um, like rim artifact if you're going to get it. It will show up here and nowhere else. So be careful. Just oh, it's not, it's not. So it's really unlikely to get like a, like a upper and lower nasal step in early glaucoma? In early glaucoma like this where there's nothing else, yeah, that would be really uncommon to just have one spot here and one spot here without really anything else and have it be that steep, a minus 30 um, would be would be uncommon. And so this just shows you what a nasal step compared to rim looks like. Why does it do this? Is it is your slideshow done or no? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't want to start. That's just yeah, okay. <laughs> Four more of these ones are fast. Okay, progression or no progression? This was the field in December 2017. This is the field in July 2019. Do I need to do a trab on this patient? What do you think? Yeah. It's certainly bad. But then you look at her other eye. And you realize she is having a stroke in your clinic and you send her to the emergency room. Oh. <laughs> that actually happened. Yeah. So just a reminder, and I am guilty of this because especially in the way that we can look at things in EPIC through AXIS, you're often, when you're doing a side-by-side -side comparison, you're not looking at, I don't start always by looking at the two fields, like the right and the left eye together. I look at right eye compared to previous right eye, right? Because I'm always looking to see if there's progression. So don't forget to look at the field as a whole so that you can make sure your patient's not dying. Okay. So this is October 2018, March 2019. Are they getting worse? Do I need to do a trab on this patient? To get the cataract? This field looks a little bit different compared to this field, right? Yeah, it's like what, nine out of 14 fixation losses? This field is a size five. This field is a size three. Mm -hmm. So this patient's seeing a lot better because the stimulus is you know, bigger by a factor of 16. So this is just a reminder, you can't compare apples to oranges. You have to do the same test on the same patient repeatedly. Again, this happens at the VA all the time, where we want a size five and they get a size three, and it's just garbage. You can't use it to compare or assess for progression. So then you get her back doing her normal, and her field looks great again, and you've saved yourself from having to do surgery on this poor nice lady. Okay, what about this one? April 2019 to July 2019, this was a guy that Dr. C sent me and was like, hey, does he have glaucoma? And 
this was the field he had coming to me. And then when I repeated it, like I said, I do about three months later, try and get a second field. It looked like this. And I had a minor heart attack. Um, so what do you do? What do you do for this guy? What are all the, I can't see any of the numbers. Are they all the same? He's pretty reliable. He's yeah. like one out of 23, 4% false negatives. What about what? The size of the stimulus. Same. 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 Everything's the same. Did he fall asleep? <clears throat> he did not fall asleep. He just told me when I asked him, I said, your field looks a whole lot worse and I'm really worried about you. He said, I didn't feel like doing it, so. <laughs> Oh, he didn't feel like doing it. I didn't know why I was doing another one so soon, and it annoyed me, and I was mad. Oh, my God. So I said, well, according to your field, you're going blind, and I need you to actually do it. And I explained to him very carefully why it was important, and his field went from this. I said, I'm going to make you come back in a month and do it again and prove to me that you can do it. And then his field looked like this. So, again... Don't trust progression until you confirm it. So if you see a field and it's a lot worse than what it was before, before you decide to do surgery on these patients, bring them back and make them do another test. I mean, he still has glaucoma, right? He still has glaucoma. Okay. I, yeah, he still has glaucoma. Okay. He's also like 45 and he's probably, normal pressure glaucoma is a disaster. If you suspect, uh, again, an abnormal result like that, how soon should you I, I made him come back two weeks later. I said, I'm going to give you two two week vacation to get over your bitterness about this test, and then you're going to come back and take it, or otherwise I'm going to operate on your eye. <laughs> and he was like, all right, fine, I'll do better. So how did he not have any like false negatives? He's just really good at not... I don't know. I mean, that just goes to show you that this is, this is sure. we're objectifying a subjective experience. And patients, I mean, like, you'll see field sure. fluctuation with, nor like, Teresa brought me one from the VA. The patient's a good test taker, and from test to test went from horrible to great with no change in their reliability and disease. So, you know, I don't know how they do it, <laughs> but they, they can. And it makes it difficult because you don't know. You don't know which one is the right one, right? Were you just having, like, a remarkable day or... You know, which one is the real one? So that's why whenever you're not sure, the moral of the Repeat. story is... Repeat your fields. Like just, if you're, if you, if something's funny, just repeat it. Explain to the patient, tell them why it's important. They won't get mad at you. Repeat the field. I feel like it's the front way. The VA that's all like repeat visual field, <laughs> visual field. Yeah, I make the VA guys come back all the time. Yeah, also, okay, I will, I will say one word. If they have repeatedly shown you. <laughs> so cool. Did you guys notice like the eyebrows? It really is true. Like eyebrow trends are like pencil, then oh, normal, okay. and now like a bushy eyebrow is super in. Isn't it? Yeah. And so they're saying if this trend continues <laughs> soon, you're gonna have to be a super weird visual. Pony eyebrow. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> We're gonna have to. Um, the other thing I will say, I. <laughs> My rule is if you live to 90, your 90th birthday present is you don't have to take fields anymore as long as your pressures are like relatively well controlled. Um, because, you know, I, I, they're not 60 anymore. I don't have to keep them seeing 40 years. I only have to keep them seeing 10 years. Also, if you've proven time and time again that you are a bad visual field test taker and you just can't do it, we shouldn't keep making you do it. So at the VA in particular, be aggressive about saying, hey, this patient has never once had a quality field, and yet we keep trying. So when I say repeat the field, repeat the field within reason, but if you've done four fields on a patient and he just can't, he's falling asleep every single time, don't make him do any more fields. There's no point. Questions?